You are listening to Cap Conversation, the digital discourse of financial services today with Capco and guests. I'm your host, Audra schoenfeld fear Head of Strategic Analytics for Capco US. Today in this podcast, we're going to be talking to Jesus Garidi, Vice President of Digital Design at the Royal Bank of Canada. Jesus, a special thanks to you for joining us today. To start us off, can you tell a little about yourself and your journey to RBC? Sure. Thank you so much for having me today, Audra. It's a pleasure being with you today and for the opportunity to discuss design and all things related to it. So I'm a designer by trade. I didn't study design. I started signing basically kind of by accident. I was working as an IT uh, technician at ad agency when I discovered there was a, a group of people in a back room called uh, designers. And when I saw what they were doing, I realized, oh, hold on a second. That's, that's exactly what I do in my spare time. But I didn't, I didn't know it had a name. I didn't know it was something you could you know, get paid to do. Um, and after that, I focused my, my career on, on design. I was lucky enough that it coincided with the beginning of uh, web design and my IT skills helped me uh, carve a niche um, in the ad agency and, and start creating uh, basically designs. Uh, I, I, wasn't, I didn't know what I was doing half of the time, but thanks to the, to the group of designers who was there, they gave me a, a direction and, and a purpose. And afterwards, I, I have held jobs either in-house uh, in, uh, in industries like video games uh, or uh, or as a consultant outside of it. As a matter of fact, before my current role at RBC, I was a group manager for uh, Milan, Madrid, and Sao Paulo for Fjord, which is a design consultancy currently owned and operated by Accenture. I, I was there for six years. Uh, and actually, that's when I started my career as a, as a manager of, of designers, uh, which, in a way, I'm still a designer, right? but instead of designing uh, UIs or, or, or services, I focus on other designers' careers, which is a lot of fun, but as well, a lot of responsibility uh, because my, my role at RBC is uh, to focus on the value of, of design in the organization. Uh, in a way, I'm responsible for the careers of all my colleagues who, who are designers within my group and uh, what is their, the value and the role that they bring to the organization. But so far, so good. I'm, I'm really happy that uh, I ended up doing what uh, I do. Uh, I seriously couldn't have forecast that uh, 20 plus years ago when I started opening Photoshop and playing with, uh, with the tools back then. Thanks for that. I think that's certainly an interesting and diverse background going from everything from the video game industry to ending up in financial services, uh, which I think brings us to, to a good kind of follow-up starter question, which is, When you think about the world of design and design thinking, um, the design thinking has been a buzzword for businesses across industries for more than a decade. What does that mean to you? And what do you think might be next uh, when you think about it from that lens? That's that's a very good question. Because in my my career, I encountered design thinking uh, at different stages of its development. Um, And the the fun thing, though, is that design thinking, we can track its roots back to the 50s and 60s. Um, and in a way, it was uh, an approach uh, to kind of democratize uh, design as a way of uh, dealing with problems. Uh, but it has had different, um, what's the word, incarnations. Um, the, the one I like to think about a lot, it's uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, a bunch of economists um, look at how decisions were be- being made in organizations. Uh, there is one in particular, Herbert Simon. Uh, he, he won a Nobel Prize uh, for his work around decision making. And um, he observed uh, a lot of people, uh, mostly in organizations like, like mine, making decisions on how they made decisions. And he uh, ended up um, coining a, a, an expression, uh, um, a definition of what design is that I, I subscribe to. He said, to design is to devise courses of action that will change current states into preferred ones. When you take the definition, uh, everybody's a designer because everybody makes decisions one way or the other, and everybody is looking to uh, change uh, current states uh, into preferred ones, being those where they they have to work less, or they have they, they earn more money, or they're more proactive, or or they they are more comfortable with their lives, whatever whatever it is. I mean. If we were in the pre-pandemic world of commuting, um, all of us take decisions on a daily basis on how do we get to work. Um, the thing, though, and the, the main difference is that 
only some of us have made a career on understanding how we make those decisions. And this is, the, this is where the same thinking comes into play. When anybody explains uh, the definition of design, uh, as Herbert uh, Simon coined it, everybody says, oh yeah, I do that, right? Uh, but then why we make so many bad decisions? Why so many business failed? Why, uh, you know, we, we are always in hindsight making not the best decisions. And this is where the same thinking started to catch on because there was this promise that uh, we could teach people how to think like a designer, how to make better decisions. And it became some sort of, you know, gateway drag onto the world of post-its. And this is where a lot of companies um, in the 90s and later on in the 2000s, starting with IDEO, made a lot of business. Because again, they told people who wanted to improve their track record for successes that they could do that by thinking like a designer. It, it helped a lot that the first stages of any design process are easy and fun. And as well, they co-opted um, the, the co-creation techniques that started as well in the, in the 60s. You can track them back uh, to Sweden. Uh, they, had a, they had a term for this, I think it was, um, I can't remember the name now, but it was uh, uh, it was not called design. It was it was something else, and it's this idea of uh, you know making a decision together rather th rather than uh, you know somebody at the top saying this is the way it is. And again, it's easy. Uh, you grab a bunch of post its. You get in a, in a, into a into a room with others. You discuss the problem, and magically you end up with you know some sort of result and al alignment. But it's not quite like that especially because when you've done that part, the difficult part arrives, which is you have to deliver on that decision. And this is, this is the, the, the genius of, uh, of Simon's definition. Uh, the, the first part of the same thing is the device, the, the course of action. What things can we do? Uh, but without the change of the current state into the preferred one, then design is nothing. It's just, you know, it's just uh, uh, smoke and mirrors. Uh, but because you can fake it through, again, post-its and workshops, it makes you feel like, yeah, you're doing something about it. Uh, people called it uh, in the last years, uh, innovation theater. And I witnessed firsthand, I, I'm guilty of that, as a matter of fact. I got excited by it. I, uh, I, I, I thought uh, it would bring a lot of alignment, and a lot of success. But when you actually confront reality, uh, as a, as a client of mine said uh, um, to me many years ago, uh, yes, you have you can you can get to dream about the space shuttle, but you have to launch it. You cannot just you know you have to you have to tighten the nuts on that rocket and make sure that rocket gets out of uh, gets enough escape velocity to get out of out of into into orbit. And that's the main challenge around the same thinking. So the same thinking is great because again, it 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 improves on average the kind of decisions that we make. But at the same time, uh, it has all these hidden traps that prevent people from uh, investing the time and, and, and money that they have to invest to make the, the, the real hard choices to bring innovation and, and new value to the market. Um, there's, there's one of these traps that I, I, I like to think about constantly, which is the, the famous quick wings. You know, at the end of the workshop, at the end of a session, uh, somebody starts saying, okay, which of these are quick wings? And people get excited because they, you know, they go, oh, this is a quick, this is a quick. The thing is, quick wins distract you from the big problems that you have probably identified through the session. They they take your focus away from the 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 big problems that you actually might have on Earth in your in your uh, design thinking session. Um, I always, I mean, I hate using Apple as an example, but every time they launch something. I have to applaud their their focus. I have to applaud their their integrity in how they make decisions and how they will make big bets, a few ones, rather than many small bets. That is how I see quick wins to be, right? Um, there is another expression that designers love to use, which is less is more. Uh, it's a quote from uh, Mies van der Rohe, a famous architect from the beginning of the 20th century, which as well, it's a plague. In, in design thinking, I've seen it used in workshops. Oh yeah, less is more. 
choose less. But the thing is with less is more is that it's not less quick wins. It's less things, but deeper. You have to go, you, you do less things so you can focus on those things and, 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 and extract more from them. And again, one of the traps of the same thinking is that you're not doing a lot of workshops, but you don't do enough of it. You don't go deep enough because workshops are not enough. You have to dedicate work, you have to dedicate time. And, and again, we got addicted to it uh, because it's, you know, it's a hell of a, of a rush to do one of those workshops. So where do we think is going next? That's a great question. And I'm gonna speak now about the, the trend that we're seeing. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm, a, I'm an example of it, of consultants or external designers uh, becoming part of, of large organizations or, or, or internal in-house teams, right? Uh, which is a, it's certainly a trend. Um, why is it a trend? Going back to Herbert Simon, because making decisions is complicated and designers uh, can help uh, others make decisions. Uh, and going back to my point that everybody makes decisions, but not everybody can make it the right way. In a, in a similar way, everybody can run, but not everybody can run a marathon and everybody can, uh, or, or not everybody is Usain Bolt. Not that designers or average are Usain Bolt. I'm not saying that. Um, but we are the, we are the coach in your, in your gym where the, the nutritionist you talk to, uh, that helps you keep focused and helps you make the right decisions. And, and sometimes, you know, you, you, you're going to eat that burger because it's very tasty and you're stressed and, and life is complicated. There is no, there's no question about that. We don't, we, you don't listen to your, your coach uh, on a daily basis, but the more you listen to, to the coach and, and the more the coach understands the, the, the role they play on the delivery of the promise that, uh, we made early on the, the more time, um, sorry, the, the better, the better results we, we, we get. Uh, so yeah, where design thing is going, it's going, uh, obviously it's going into the, the, the adoption of it by organizations because they are hiring designers left and right. Uh, but the designers, when they are inside of the organizations, they have to demonstrate that we're not just posts and workshops, that we are here to help organizations, um, get to the finish line and launch, uh, products and services into the, into the market that bring value both to the business to our, and to our customers as well. And that is not easy because as well, designers for many years, we got used to the, the design thinking Kool-Aid and we got used to just doing workshops and post-its and that is certainly not enough. Such good points. That leads me to my first question. In large organizations, you have a lot of senior executives with varying levels of expertise across financial services, but not necessarily in a design mindset. How do you promote design literacy in a large organization? Um, that's a great question. When I when I started at RWC, I, I found I found uh, that most people's perception of design was uh, to make things pretty. I'm simplifying, just for the record. I mean, a lot of uh, my, my my colleagues, all of them are, are very smart. As you said, they they know their business very very well. Uh, but it's it's how how it was perceived, as in. We were there just to uh, put a layer of, of aesthetics on top of something so people will be enticed to use it. The problem with that is that it hides more than people think. Uh, I like to use examples like Craigslist, for example. Craigslist has been in business for 20 plus years now, and it's extremely successful. And if you ask people, it's, it's Craigslist pretty. Most people will say, well, no, I don't think so. Uh, but did you use it? Yes, I use it. And does it work? Yes, it works. So would you say it's well-designed? And usually they tend to say, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, because it works. And that goes to the point of, I mean, that uh, I guess Steve Jobs' famous quote, um, yeah, design is how it works, not how it looks. And it's building, building understanding through those kind of dialogues that you get to change uh, people's perception. So when I when I joined um, my team, the name of the team was uh, the label of the team was the the, the UX UI team. And um, apart from telling stories like this often, which gets very boring, but it's my role and I have to do it. Um, one of the things I did was uh, simplification of roles 
I had, I think at the time, like 20, 20 something different roles. Um, and as well, we became, instead of the uh, UX UI team, we became the digital design team. So it's a combination of uh, stories, narratives, uh, and, and labels, and as well simplification of the service that we provide. Um, if you, uh, like any service you would use, if it becomes too complex to engage with, people either misinterpret it, or they only use parts of it, or they they have challenges with it. So you have to simplify it. So that was the part where we basically look at our roles and what we did, and we went, you know what, from 20 down to five. Uh, actually four at the time, because we ended up adding design research later later on, and goes back as well to your question, but anyways, I'll get back to that later. The, the change with the UX, UA to, to design was um, as well to signify a change. We're different. We're not anymore the, the team that you used to engage with, that it was here to make things pretty. We're here to make design. But it was as well intended to signal to the organization that we didn't own user experience. And this was done with a lot of intent. The thing is, user experience is delivered by everybody in the organization because all the decisions we make affect that user experience. Uh, which servers do we have? How our code works? Which products are offered to you? All that affects the user experience. So it, we can't be called, we can be named something that we do not fully own. It didn't make sense to me. So that's why I said, you know what? We're not the UX team anymore. Because all of you, all of us, from the CEO down to the person who takes care of the branches, everybody is part of the user experience. I feel that is working as you're running one of the largest design groups in Canada. How do you attract new talent to this ecosystem or the design world that you built? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, you have to ask yourself, what is that you're offering that nobody else is offering? And you have to ask yourself as well, for how long is that going to keep people engaged? I'm really thankful to Fjord for the opportunities that I got back back then with them. Um, we were in a growth uh, mode at the, at the time, so there were opportunities left and right. And I was lucky enough to work again in Madrid, in as well in New York, San Francisco, um, managing designers. And um, you have to be very savvy in terms of, especially in New York, San Francisco, as well as London probably, because there are highly competitive design markets. Meaning, yes, there is tons of designers, but there is tons of people vying for their talent. So that experience gave me a sense of um, what do I this, this answering this question? What is that? What is that I do that it's gonna attract this talent and and hopefully retain that talent for a period of time? You can't fool yourself thinking that you're the end and all of all things. Uh, especially, especially right now with design, where designers are being offered uh, good salaries, uh, doing very interesting things uh, all over the world. So this is probably the second point. You have to understand which designers you want to hire. I'm interested in designers who want to understand the, the problem that money is as a concept, want to understand how a bank can help society, uh, in particular Canada, uh, and, and want to work with problems that get more and more complicated as time passes. And the third thing, again, going back to the point of what, what I'm, I, I'm offering them, is that my promise to designers who join RBC is that they are going to be working in interesting problems, but as well, they're going to be better at design. They're going to understand better the value they bring to organization. They're going to develop new skills. They're going to, uh, new way, they're going to see new ways of working. Uh, they might not like the ways of working. They might not agree with what we're doing, um, and that's fine as well. But I can, I can assure them that when they leave RBC, they're going to have uh, learned something that is going to make them better at what they do. Um, so that is, a, that is a promise that I have to commit to in order to attract, uh, to attract talent. Yeah, thanks. But I think from, from our lens, certainly you hit on a great point that the complexity of problems that are to be solved in financial services is very deep and robust. And I think 
one of the things around that, and you commented on this earlier, is the desire to make decisions based on evidence and being able to embed that into the actual, you know, front end experience, um, especially in the world kind of from a banking lens. And we're seeing a continued evolution, certainly in innovative and disruptive technology to either enable, you know, better tracking information um, for better, for worse about people or more sophisticated recommendation engines on SFX action. But basically, I think every day it feels like there's a new fintech out there successfully taking on, you know, pieces of that and then helping that that you can embed into, you know, an experience. So I'm curious with all that, you know, how does RBC keep up with that ever increasing customer demands and user expectation, um, especially in the face of those fast moving fintechs who I think have more of the luxury, I'd say, to specialize, you know, on pieces of that in specific areas? Very good question, Audra. Thanks for that. Um, it's a combination of things. First, um, RBC, it's a customer centric bank. That means that we obsess about our customers. Uh, the challenge is when you move to a digital world, the distance between you and your customer uh, widens, basically it becomes, it becomes uh, larger. When, when a customer comes into a branch, um, you can see their face, you can interact with them. And obviously nowadays that is very complicated because of the pandemic, but and um, we we create these connections with uh, with uh, with the with the customer, and it creates these feedback loops that uh, we can we can react to very very quickly. In a digital context, those uh, reactions are more complicated because the data we have mostly is just what what did you do with our product, not necessarily why did you do it, right? Uh, I mean, you you tap on a button on the mobile app, you click on this link on the website. You might have replied to an email. Um, I mean, a reply to the email, obviously, you give us some, some content, but a click, it's not enough, right? So we've developed, I mean, the, the bank has already a, a strong muscle uh, around customer experience uh, and research. Um, we've taken that muscle and we've developed it um, to the point that we, we obsess about when is the last time any of our employees heard or so a customer doing something with our services. Uh, because without that connection, without that feedback loop, we become detached. We, we I mean, customers stop being uh, human beings and they start just being numbers in a, in a chart. Um, that is super important to, to us. Um, but that as well give us insights on what are the things that really matter to our customers. And, and it's, it's complicated because we have a lot of them and you cannot just uh, segment them uh, that easily. And if I learned anything from intersectionality, um, sub, sub grouping them might help us understand certain problems, but not every problem. And for every single uh, piece of work we have to do, we have to rethink those, those groups. We have to rethink those segments and, and, and trying to solve all with just one definition of what humans are is just impossible. And I think this is one of the one of the failures that fintechs tend tend to do. In my in my experience and from what I've seen, they tend to be uh, one trick ponies in the sense that they solve one problem for one particular subgroup of that particular context. Like we've seen customers using fintechs for a specific thing. But even the fintech might have over, over their services, they stay with us for the rest. Thanks for that. I think that uh, that makes sense for me. And the disruption piece is, you know, not an immaterial comment because I think you even mentioned earlier uh, in your discussion about the the innovation fear. So trying to actually do things that are going to be disruptive is a slower journey than uh, in reality. But I think there's been some really helpful uh, insights and, and discussion here. So I appreciate your your time today. As a final thought, I was wondering, are there any of the most interesting design innovations you think you've seen recently or, you know, shiny objects, if you want to call it that, or anything you thought would be worth talking about uh, in a more material way? Whenever I see anything that I think is disruptive or innovative, I always see what's behind it. And there's always a context where that comes from. Um, machine learning, for example, which or cryptocurrencies, uh, which are two of the of the of the biggest tech innovation in the last 10 years. 
we've been working with machine learning in a way for actually more than 20 years, 30 years now. Uh, it, it, it was an approach that in the 80s, it was disregarded by most of the AI community uh, as, a, as a silly approach because you know it's, it's based on statistical analysis rather than on trying to develop actual consciousness. Uh, but reality is that pragmatic approach now has become the prevalent way of solving um, AI or the way we think about AI, which on its own, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting debate. Uh, what is what is AI and what's not AI, uh, or cryptocurrencies? Um, same thing. Um, we could have done what blockchain does before blockchain existed, and there were some experiments um, on that uh, on that uh, direction. But then the underlying thing that has enabled uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies is the internet. And without the internet, uh, you you couldn't have cryptocurrencies. So I'm always very kind of like reluctant of saying, oh, look at that, that is the next big thing, because it's there's always something that predates it, something that comes from comes before from it, like BBSs came before the internet, I guess, or during the internet. Um, uh, and, and I tend to not get uh, extremely excited. One of the things you touched on with machine learning, AI, algorithms, et cetera, you know, I've been noticing, especially now, how valuable some of that AI can be. For example, with RBC, it's your product Nomi, which understands spending behavior and tucks away money that is regularly spent and puts it in savings. Can you tell me a little bit more about the long-term design strategy behind this functionality? The funny thing with with uh, Nomi Finance Safe, which is the, the part of Nomi you, you were talking about, the, the hidden yard, it is an idea that has existed in, in financial environments for, I think it's, I, I think I tried to track it, I think it's for over 40 years, uh, which is hilarious. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the, one of the poster childs for design thinking approaches uh, was an idea project with Bank of America. They had it on their website for our, for the longest of time. Um, I can't remember the name of the project now, but it was it was the same idea. Like we every time every time you you make a transaction, we round it up and we take that round up and we put it on a on a on a jar for you to use it later. Because every every time you make a you make you make a model, uh, it's obvious that with with very little saving on a daily on a daily basis. People can go a long way over, over a long time, right, Jason? Because you're getting a very good point with the whole long-term, short-term thinking, which is it's a problem with money uh, all the time. It's like, I mean, if you, if you ask uh, people what they want out of the bank, everybody says more money. But that's the one thing that is very complicated for banks to give you uh, because we don't make the money. We have to work with the money that you as an individual or as a family can generate. So um, Nomi uses, uh, is built on this idea that, again, it's not new, it's, it's old. Uh, but I, up until Nomi, I hadn't seen successful implementations of this idea. Uh, RBC had their own idea, their own service, uh, which was the, the system worked very, very similarly. Bank of America had it as well. And none of them were successful by, by most metrics, uh, which is important too. Um, but Nomi, the difference with Nomi is, as we're getting at, um, it's two things in my in my opinion. One, it's the that it's AI powered. We do not take money, so we do not put money in that jar uh, without making a decision based on a on a on a framework which is analyzing your spending patterns, analyzing how much money you have, analyzing the the the, the, the bills you're gonna pay. But the second thing, which is even more important, it's this idea of uh, helping you be better uh, and helping you understand better what is going on with your finances. On average, most people um, don't want to be told what to do with their money, um, which is totally fair. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, it's our money. Uh, but at the same time, they want help to save. So there's this fine balance between helping you do something that you know you want to do and I'm going to use a diet example again, like losing weight or being fit. But when we tell you what to do, you tend to shy away from. Because again, the burger, super tasty. And I'm stretching that metaphor way too long. But anyways, you get the idea. So using, using uh, something like Nomi uh, and explaining little by little what's going to happen and, and doing it progressively uh, and doing it with, with you noticing but without you noticing, it's how we can get to to where we are with it, which, in my opinion, 
uh, so far it's an unrivaled success, to be honest. Um, uh, clients who use it are, are very happy with it, uh, that both the insights and as well the finance. But it's taken us years to get to this point. We didn't just launch it and that was it. We, we first launched uh, parts of it. Uh, when we saw people were comfortable with those, those parts, we started launching more parts and more parts. And, and it was like a dialogue rather than uh, least, you know, um, us telling, here it is, and that's it. No, it was, hey, we're going to do this thing here. You might be interested in it. And some people were, some people weren't. But we kept, you know, it's it's like going going to the branch and 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 your your advisor telling you, hey, have you thought about this? And you're going, yeah, I'm not interested right now. Six months later, hey, have you thought about this? And look at this thing here that it makes sense that you would do this. And at that time, you might say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. But doing it digitally and doing it with a human involved uh, and 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 prodding people when they're in their houses and they're not seeing you and it's way more complicated. Uh, not not because it's super complicated as in it's rocket science, but because many of us have different reactions to these things, and uh, and it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of uh, decisions that can go the other way. I mean, we don't want to be creepy. We don't want to be to to make you say, oh, hold on a second, what's going on here? I'm, I'm being uh, they're stealing money from my accounts. No, we don't want that. Um, that's a lot of balancing, a lot of work. That we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't think we had to assume, and we didn't want to launch without uh, a lot of thinking and a lot of evidence and a lot of research and a lot of testing and experimenting. And it goes back to the early point about less is more. How, yeah, it's it's very easy, right? You're just taking money from one place to the other, but doing it, there is a lot of more depth to it than what people think. So I feel like part of what you're saying is that design never ends. Because situations continue to change, technology changes, customer expectations shift and move around. And it's a job that is infinite to a certain degree. You're right on the money. I mean, the, the day I, I, we launch something, the moment you launch something to the market, that stops being the best at what it's meant to be. The more things you put in the market, the more things you have to maintain and the, the less time you have to think about new things. So you have to be very, very careful of what do you do with that. But yeah, design is never done. And I think on the never done, never perfect, we've really appreciated your time today, Jesus. Uh, as we talked through, it's such a great view on, I think, the complexity that goes into the importance of design. And certainly we drilled down into financial services, you know, Capco focuses today as well. But we've really enjoyed having you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's been it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I don't get many opportunities to uh, rant about my favorite topics, which is uh, design, money and human problems and human condition. So yeah, thank you so much for being such gracious hosts and uh, have a great day. Thank you. You've been listening to Cap Conversation, a Capco production. This podcast is for information only and should not and does not constitute consulting services. Mm-hmm.